thanks so much for being with us at Livewire Church Online. We know that today's message is really going to make a difference in your day. It's going to make a difference in your week. So we want to thank you for joining us. So let's get ready because we're about to get wired to the vine of life. Hey, welcome to Livewire Church, everybody. It's good to have you here. Good to see you guys today. Great to have you with us. Yes, we are kicking off our Christmas series. And I know some of you are probably like, what do you mean we're kicking off our Christmas series? We haven't even gotten through Thanksgiving yet. Yes, I know. And actually, uh, just bear with me for a couple moments because you will see that this is also relating to Thanksgiving. But we are kicking off our Christmas series, All I Want for Christmas. All I Want for Christmas is the series, and uh, if you think about it, I mean, it is looking a lot like Christmas already, isn't it? Have you noticed decorations are already going up or have already gone up? Actually, decorations have already gone up probably since Halloween passed. Did you notice that? I mean, we saw this transformation all of a sudden at, uh, at Walmart where it was like, the next day after, after Halloween, it was like, here's Christmas. I mean, they are rolling out all the decorations, the trees, and all the, the Christmas goodies, all of that. Have you noticed on your radio stations, they're already playing Christmas songs. How many of you are already sick of the Christmas songs? You know, like, I get tired of them fast. And, and, I, I'm, I, and I'm sorry, I love Way FM, but they play them way too much. <laughs> You know, it's like one Christmas song after another. I love the holidays. I love the Christmas season. But man, you know, let's spread it out a little bit. Have you noticed that decorations are going up? Christine and I, we work out over at Crunch and uh, right there uh, uh, next to Vineyards and on Pine Ridge. And, um, and we went over to going over to Crunch one day and we started noticing already the wreaths are out. You know how they put up their their decorations, lights are out, and you probably see this in your neighborhood. Maybe you've seen that uh, uh, people already have their decorations up. They've got their lights up. I mean, they're just jumping on it. All I want for Christmas. All I want for Christmas. And so the thing is this, and this is what we're going to look at in this series, but um, I can guarantee you this about this Christmas season. I can guarantee you some things that people are going to do in this holiday season. One of the things that people are going to do, people will spend money they don't have on things they don't need. That's materialism. There's going to be a bunch of people that are going to be spending a bunch of money, and some of those people might be us, but they're going to be spending a bunch of money on things they don't need, money that they don't have. Another thing I can guarantee you, uh, uh, guarantee is, People will spend money just to have newer and better. In case you didn't know, that's consumerism. And we need consumerism, obviously, but we don't need extreme consumerism. And there are going to be a bunch of people, they're going to be out there on Black Friday, right? They're going to be looking for the steals, the deals. The funny thing, or actually it's not even all that funny, but the crazy thing is this, is that we're going to get out there on Black Friday and we're thinking about other people very little, like family members, friends, and we're thinking about, man, the deals I want to get for me, right? Come on, I know. Listen, I, I, I'm with you. I know. I'm there. It's like we're seeing those things and we're like, oh man, I want to buy that for me. Forget so and so. I want to buy that for me. And so we're going to spend money just to have newer and better. Think about these things, materialism, consumerism, and consumerism. And then I also guarantee that there are going to be people who will be thinking about themselves more than others, and that's egoism. Materialism, consumerism, egoism. What if, what if this holiday season, what if we were more concerned about other people than we were about ourselves? What if this holiday season, and what if it wasn't just this holiday season, what if this is just the way that we did business? Notice the title of the series is All I Want for Christmas. All I want, I want, I, 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 right? I mean, and isn't this, not, not only is this something that we wrestle with throughout the year because we're, we're just our, our human nature, in our human nature, it, uh, selfishness comes so easy to us, but especially in this Christmas season, we're thinking about I, I, me, 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 Black Friday. Oh, yeah, the deals, the steals. Oh, I want to get, get this for me, 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 me. All I want for Christmas. What if, just as the song was portraying, what if all I wanted for Christmas was you, something for you? 
What if all I wanted for Christmas this year, what if all I wanted every single day of my life was more of God and, and more of people, being able to give to people? Now, the thing about that is, you know, I mean, there's something that we may wrestle with that, but at the same time, think about this for a moment. To help, and, and let me just go back for a uh, uh, backtrack for just a second. If you have your bulletin and you want to track with us, uh, you could fill in the blanks on the back side of the, uh, the announcements, or you could also go to the, to the Bible app, click on events, and uh, Livewire Experience is on there, and you can, uh, if you, if you want to use your mobile device, but you could track with us. And the first one I, I want to just make mention of is to help people is to help people. Now, I know that that sounds simple. But think about that for a moment. When we help people, like I used this example last week, if, if somebody was in a hole, if they were in a ditch and they cannot get themselves out, and I come walking by or you come walking by and we're like, oh, wow, you know, you, do you need a hand? Let me get you out of there. And we lend them a hand. We just help them get out of a ditch, get out of a hole that otherwise they would not have gotten themselves out of, that they would not have gotten out of, right? So to help people, to help that person, help them. And, and let me just bring it even, even more real than that. When you walked in, you probably saw a bunch of boxes back there, and Christine mentioned it in the announcements. This church, friends, you have helped 21 families with your donations, financial donations, with your, the groceries, the, the, uh, the food donations. You have helped 21 families. This church has helped 21 families have Thanksgiving that otherwise they would have struggled to put Thanksgiving on their table or they may not have had a Thanksgiving whatsoever. Friends, you help them. These people were helped. Families are coming right after church from 1130 to 130. They're going to be coming in and they're going to be picking up their boxes. And they're going to come in and, and they're just going to, they're going to have smiles on their faces, but they're going to leave with big smiles and joy knowing that they're going to be able to provide a Thanksgiving dinner for their family. And that's because of you. That's because you said, you know what? I am going to help people. I'm going to help somebody. To help somebody is to actually help them. You're actually helping these families. What if, friends, what if that's just the way we did business? And more specifically, Christians, body of Christ, Jesus followers, what if that was the way we did business? But here's the thing. Why should we be concerned about people why should we focus on people if God's not? Or is he? See, what if, what if we weren't concerned about materialism, consumerism, egoism? What if the only ism word that we were concerned about was actually altruism? And altruism is when you have an unselfish or selfless concern for the welfare of others, for the well-being of others. That's what altruism is. But the thing is, it's like, why should you and I bother if God's not that way? If God doesn't care? Or does he? And that's what we want to look at. In fact, uh, one of Jesus' closest disciples, uh, John, records Jesus' words. And you'll probably be familiar with, this, with these verses, uh, even if you didn't grow up in church. Notice what Jesus says. John records it. He says, for God loved the world so much. Now, this could be that God loved the planet, that God loved planet Earth, but you'll see that Jesus clarifies. He says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone, so he's, he's bringing this into focus. He's saying, I'm not talking about planet Earth, although God loves planet Earth, but God doesn't love planet Earth nearly as much as he loves everyone that fills planet Earth. God doesn't love planet Earth nearly as much as he loves every single human being, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that fills planet Earth. He says God so loved the world. He loved people. He loved humanity so much that he did what? He gave his one and only son. Let me ask you something. Would we be willing to give up our child for a group of people? Like, would you be, I could tell you right now, I'd struggle with that. And I haven't even adopted my kids yet. And I already would struggle with that. Like I would, already, I would already struggle with giving my child up for a group of other people. You and I would wrestle with that. But here's what God did. God gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, everyone who believes that Jesus died for them, that he came back to life, that he ascended into heaven, everyone who believes that will have eternal life. Notice it goes on. 
God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Now, the thing that I want to I wanna hone in on is that God gave. And notice in the, the second half of this verse that God sent his son into the world not to judge the world. Did you know that God, that Jesus didn't come to this earth to judge people? That Jesus didn't, when he walked this earth, when you read about the life of Christ in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't see Jesus going around condemning people. You don't see Jesus going around judging people. You don't see Jesus going around ridiculing people. You don't see Jesus looking down his nose at people and, and telling them how horrible, how horrible they are and that they better get their life together. No, when Jesus came into the world, and still this is God's heartbeat, when Jesus came into the world, he came to save the world. He came to save humanity. God gave his one and only son. I would actually say it this way. God is so in love with humanity that he sacrificed his son to save us. That he sacrificed his son. It wasn't the Jews that killed Jesus Christ. It wasn't even the Romans that killed Jesus Christ. It wasn't even Pilate who had the authority to kill Jesus Christ. It wasn't even Pilate that killed Jesus Christ. God sacrificed his son. In fact, Jesus tells Pilate this. If you, if you look at uh, John chapter 19, notice what John writes. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Jesus said, you would have no power over me at all unless it, would gi it were given to you from above. Jesus said, Pilate, you wouldn't have any power over me unless it was given to you by my father. Just a little side note here. It doesn't matter who is the president of the United States. I don't care if your candidate won or your candidate didn't win. My trust is not in whoever the president is of the United States that's going to be president. I, my, my trust is not in Donald Trump. I am so thankful, though, that we have a democracy. I'm so thankful that we get the opportunity to choose our president. But whether your candidate won or not, what matters is that God is still on the throne and that he's still king and that he's still Lord and that he's still in control. Control. And so the fact of the matter is, here's the thing, friends. The reason why people have power, men have power, whether they're dictators, whether they're kings, whether they're presidents, whatever their title is, the only reason they have power is because God has allowed them to have power. But the fact of the matter is God is in control. He knows what he's doing. And Jesus proves it to Pilate. And he says, listen, you think that you have authority to kill me. You think that the Jews delivered you up to, to kill me and that the Jews have authority. None of you have authority. The only one that has the, the authority, the only one that's given you that authority, Pilate, is God. The fact of the matter is, friends, God sacrificed his son because he loved humanity and he loves humanity that much that he was willing to give up think about that give up his one and only son we would not do that we would struggle we would have such a hard time doing that and god gave up his son for humanity gave i want you to hone into that word give gave given because you're going to hear it over and over and remember, we asked the question, why should we care? Like, why should we care about people? Maybe all I want for Christmas, it should be all I want, all I. It should be just about me because why should I care about humanity? Does God, does God even care? So here's what I want to look at. For the next couple of minutes, I want to run through seven things where I believe God demonstrates altruism or where I, I believe that God demonstrates, and this is not even exhaustive because we're not even exhausting what all God has given and how much God has demonstrated uh, that he cares for humanity. How unselfishly concerned, selflessly concerned God is for the welfare of humanity, for your welfare, for your well-being, but not just you. Every person right here in our city, every person in our state, our nation, and all around the world. I want to share with you seven things, and one of them comes from, the first one comes from John 3.16, from God, God so loving the world. Number one, God is so altruistic, he gave you Jesus. He is so selfless. Think about that. He gave, again, his one and only son. He gave us Jesus Christ. God didn't have to do that. 
In fact, if you, if you look at history, if you look at humanity, humanity is the one that has always, that is constantly, first off, go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve turned their back on God, and humanity has done this over and over and over and over. It's like this roller coaster ride where we're like, we want God, we don't want God. We want God, we don't want God. We got, want God, you know. It's over and over. We see this throughout history. I mean, God had every right from the beginning, and God had every right at any point in history to say, you know what, let's just nix this whole humanity thing. I'm just going to start all over. He had every right to, but he loves humanity too much, guys. He loves us too much. And so God is so altruistic, he gave you Jesus. Galatians 1.4, notice what Paul writes here. He says, Jesus gave, there it is, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned in order to, notice this, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Jesus gave his life willingly according to the Father's plan. What God planned, this is how God his Father, this is how God the Father planned it, and Jesus said, I am willing to do it. Parents, you wrestle with this because you wish that your child would just be willing to clean their room when you ask them to clean their room, right? It's like, I'm, here's my plan for you for the next hour. I need you to clean your room. Are you willing to do that? No, I'm not. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity, but no, I'm not willing to do that, mom. I'm not willing to do it. It's an incredible opportunity that you've given me, Dad. Now, obviously, you know, your son or daughter wouldn't say that because you might bop them upside the head and then ask for forgiveness later from God and them. But the fact of the matter is, our children, they don't often do willingly what we want them to do, like clean their room or pick up their toys or eat their vegetables, right? But Jesus did. Jesus said, Father, I am willing to do whatever you want me to do. In fact, Jesus even, the, the realization of this really hit him when he uh, got away. You remember when uh, they had the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples, and then they went off to, to pray, and Jesus was in agony because the realization of what he was getting ready to do had just struck him. In fact, uh, it, it's recorded that Jesus dripped uh, drops of blood, that he sweat drops of blood, which uh, science has proven, doctors have proven, uh, history has proven that this is something that could actually happen, that you could be so stressed, that you could, be, you could have so much stress that you, you would actually sweat drops of blood, not just drops of water, but actually drops of blood. And Jesus did this. Why? Because he knew what was getting ready to happen. And you know what he said? He said, Father, take this cup away from me, if it's possible. But not my will, but your will be done. I mean, parents, wouldn't you just love that? Wouldn't you just love that your children's, you know, I really don't want to do this, mom, dad, but not my will. Your will be done, mom, dad. <laughs> right? I would just love that. You would just love that. Jesus was willing. In fact, number two is this Jesus is so unselfish, he gave up his life to release you from sin's prison. He released us. God so loved the world, he sent his son. Jesus did his job. He lived that life of total perfection that you and I could not live, that we could never live. And he released us from sin's prison because that's how unselfish he is. Notice Paul writes in Romans 8.33, he says, Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. In other words, Paul's saying, who, who could bring a claim against us? No one has that authority because only God has the, has the final judgment. And so when, when people judge you, when people condemn you, I'm sure that's happened to you in, in your life before. When people have done that to me, honestly, they have no right to condemn me. They could say all that they want. They could do all they want. The one who has the final judgment is God himself. And that's the point that Paul's making here. He's saying no one has, has that right. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. In an older translation, you would see the word righteousness, but that's what righteousness means. It means to be in right standing with God. God has made us right with himself. Number three is this. God is so sympathetic, he judges you innocent of all your crimes. Now, you may, you may be like, well, Josh, you know, I've, I've not committed any crimes. I've never stolen anything. I've never done anything illegal. Let me just ask you something. Have you ever done anything 
just even remotely bad, that's a crime against God. That's what, what, what I'm using as the word crime here is the word sin. And the word sin just simply means to miss the mark. It's like, it's like shooting an arrow at the bullseye and you just don't hit the bullseye. You actually miss the mark. You miss the bullseye. And if every single one of us are honest, every single one of us have missed that mark. Every single one of us from childhood to even into our adult years, we have missed the mark from time to time. And God is so sympathetic. He says, hey, I'm the one who has the final judgment. And my judgment is that you are innocent of all your crimes. He smacks the gavel down and he says, innocent. My judgment is innocent. How incredible is that? Again, just to back up for a second, did you know that God himself has given, give, gave, given? Notice, notice that, okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, we actually looked at this verse a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Paul's writing to his protege, Timothy, and he says this, this letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, who gives us hope, who gives us hope. Again, gives. He gives us hope. God is the one who gives us hope. Paul says, you know, I was appointed. Uh, we talked about this in the message I belong a couple weeks back. You can go to our website, wiredalive.com, and check it out. But he says, I was appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, who gives us hope. Number four, God is so generous, he gives you confident, favorable expectation. That's what hope is. How many of you remember the cartoon, Winnie the Pooh? Anybody remember that cartoon? All right. Anybody remember Eeyore, the donkey, right? Do you remember Eeyore and how much of a sourpuss he always was, right? I mean, Eeyore, he would say something like, you know, I hope it doesn't rain outside, but it probably will. I hope that I find my way back home, but I probably won't. And that is, friends, that is actually the world's view and definition of hope. That it's this wishful thinking. That it's, I hope that I get out of this situation, but it's probably not gonna happen. I hope that I get the promotion, but I probably won't. I hope that I don't get sick in this holiday season, but I probably will. I hope that I say Mary forever, but I probably won't. And that's the world's idea of hope. Can I just give you a newsflash? To God, that is not hope at all. Hope is a confident, favorable expectation. Hope is something that we can confidently expect that God is going. We can expect favorable results in our life. So we can expect favorable results in our situations, in our circumstances. We can expect favorable results in, uh, in, in just our, our uh, things that we're facing. We can expect favorable results in, in the afterlife. We can know, we can know that when I die, because I've chosen Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life, when I die, I'm going to spend eternity with God. We can, we can have hope. We can have a favorable expectation. We can expect a favorable result in the uncertainties of life simply because, and here's why we could have hope, because God's word is true. His word is true. And this is why, friends, you and I should get into our Bibles because the seven things that we're talking about, that doesn't even touch all that God's given and all that God desires and all that God promises for our life. And the only way that we're going to know the things that we could hope for, that we, the things that we could stand on, that we could say, hey, I know this is going to come about in my life. I know that God is going to work this out. Why? Because God has promised it. Why? Because I see it in his word. And because we see it in his word, we could stand on it and know that we can confidently, favorably expect God to do it in our lives. Why? Because God is not like a man or another human being that he would lie to you and me. He's not going to do it. He's not a liar. I don't care if your past boyfriends were all liars, ladies. I don't care if all your past girlfriends were all liars, guys. 
I don't care if you've been lied to all of your life. That is not who God is. God is not a liar. And when he promises something, it's going to happen in our lives. As we honor him, as we honor his word, as we're walking in step, as we are willing, willingly walking with him, as Jesus walked with him. And yeah, we won't be perfect. I get that. But as we are willingly walking with him according to his plan, God is going to fulfill his best in our lives. And you'll see this in another point in just a moment. But the fact of the matter is, hope is not, well, I hope, I hope, I hope that I I hope that when I die, I go to heaven. I probably won't because I've made a lot of mistakes. No, you can rest assured that if you've chosen Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, if you've prayed the simple prayer, you believed, as, just, as John wrote, you believed, then you can rest assured that you're going to heaven. And that's why, friends, I don't have a fear of dying. Now, yeah, I don't want to die. Like, I want to be able to live a full life. I don't really want to get all that old, so I want God kind of to take me before, my, you know, I start kind of, you know, I'm hunched back and all of that, and I, I really don't, I, I don't want to get all, all, all that old, so I, I'd rather God take me before then, but at the same time, I want to live a full life, but the fact of the matter is, I don't struggle with death, because I know where I'm going. I know to be absent from this body, to give up my last breath, is to be immediately present with my God, with my Savior, and with my Lord, all because I have hope. Why? Because God gives me hope. He gives you hope. He gives humanity hope. Notice what Paul writes to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. He says, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. The good news, and he's talking about Gentiles, and more specifically, he's saying, those of you that are unchurched, you didn't grow up with, the, with God and knowing God or with the Bible. He says, those of you that are unchurched have also heard the truth. In other words, the truth or the gospel, the good news, wasn't just for the Jews. It didn't say God so loved the Jews. And it didn't say that God so loved just whatever nation you want to put in the blank. God so loved the world. He loved humanity. And so Paul says, you know, even you Gentiles, even you people that didn't grow up with God, the good news is for you. He says, you've also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. He says, you've been given the Holy, Holy Spirit. And actually, he, Paul writes this, he says, Whom, who was promised a long, a long ago. In fact, this is some of the, uh, the prophets in the Old Testament. Some of God's prophets, they prophesied or they foretold about God pouring out his Holy Spirit. Joel prophesied about that. Isaiah prophesied. David prophesied and said, hey, God's going to pour out his Holy Spirit. And what that simply means is this, is that God is not just in heaven and just like sitting up there and is just kind of leaving us on our own and just kind of letting us try to figure this out. And, and maybe, maybe for you, maybe you didn't grow up with that father figure in your life where your dad was around, or maybe you didn't grow up with that mother figure in your life where your mom was around, and maybe your parents didn't have time for you. And they didn't spend time with you. And maybe they just always put you in front of the TV or always put you in front of the video games or always had you babysat. And they were just so consumed with their job and so consumed with their career. Let me just say this. I apologize for that. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that is who God is. Because that is not what God is like. That is not what your heavenly father is like. See, he's not sitting up in heaven saying, well, I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for them. He's not doing that. In fact, number six is this, or number five is this. God is so selfless, he gives you himself. He's so selfless. He says, I want to give you, me, personally. I don't want to just give you stuff like hope. I don't want to just give you strength. I don't want to just comfort you. I don't want to just give you the truth. I want to give you me. I want to be with you every step of the way, through every challenge, through every situation and every circumstance, through every question. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. I want to spend time with you. God says, hey, I'm going to give you me. I mean, think about it. God could have 
gave us his angels, or, or we could have just settled for that. I mean, we know that angels are, are, uh, are, are around, are all over the earth, and God gives us his angels, help us, and all of that. But God says, you know what? It's not just going to be my angels. I'm going to give you me. You have me. How awesome is that? I don't know about you guys, but I don't have nowhere near the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom for everything that relates to life like God does. And there are so many uncertainties in life, as we said a few moments ago, that I, I, I mean, I don't know what I would do. I honestly don't know what I would do if I did not have that peace that God gives me because he gives you and I himself. He gives us himself. Again, notice, he gives, he gave, he's given. So God is so selfless. He says, I'm going to give you myself. I mean, how awesome would that be? Think of your, the profession that you're in, you, the career that you're in, your expertise. Think of the person that is the absolute best at what you do. And what if that person texted you one day or Facebook messaged you or, which people don't really do all that often anymore, but actually called you and said, hey, you know what? I've, I've heard that you're interested in this career or I've heard that you're, you're uh, involved in, in, in this type of field and I am the absolute best at it and I'm willing to give you me. I'm willing to spend time with you. I'm willing to teach you everything that... That would be so invaluable, wouldn't it? Friends, we have God. I mean, hey, Bill Gates, awesome. Mark Zuckerberg, awesome. Donald Trump, awesome. Whoever, awesome. These people that have made millions of dollars, these people that have, have successful businesses or successful careers, whatever, awesome. But how much more, how much better is it that we have God, unlimited knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Do we even understand? Do we even realize what we've been given? God himself. Notice Paul writes in Romans 12, 6. He says this, in his grace, God has given us, there it is again, given us different gifts for doing certain things well. We alluded to this a few moments ago. And so number six is this, God is so benevolent, he makes you really good at certain things. He's so giving. He's so benevolent. He says, I'm going to give a few gifts to you. And that's why there are some things that you're good at that I'm not good at. And that's why, like our singers and our instrumentalists, that's why they're up here and they sing. And some of us aren't up here, like myself, and don't sing. I, I, I can guarantee you this. We would not have a church for too much longer if I was the one leading worship every single Sunday. It would start dwindling. It would start dwindling and dwindling. And I'm wondering, man, why are we losing people? Why are we losing people? Why are we down to five people now? It's because of that stinking worship. That guy up there, he doesn't have a gift to sing. He should be off the stage, right? See, there are some things that you're good at. You are so good at. You are extra good at. You are really good at that I'm not good at and vice versa. There are there are some of you that should be on a stage. There are some of you that should be teaching. There are some of you that should not. You don't have that gift. You don't. But the fact of the matter is you do have gifts. You do have things that you're really good at, and I have things that I'm really good at, and it's because God has given us those things. Let's go to number seven, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Notice what Paul writes. He says, teach those who are rich. Now, when Paul is addressing the wealthy people, he's specifically honing in on the wealthy people, but what he's saying applies to all of us. It's just that the wealthy, they wrestle with this a little bit more than those of us who don't have a whole lot of money. And even those of us that don't think like myself, that no, I don't have a whole lot of money. We are, when you put it in perspective, we are more wealthy than a lot of people around the world, especially people in third world countries. So really, from both those perspectives, we're receiving what Paul is, is writing here. But notice what he says. He says, teach everyone. 
Those who are rich specifically, because they wrestle with this a little, a little bit more, but he says, teach everyone who, in, who are in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Isn't that awesome? I mean, think about how incredible those words are. That God wants us to enjoy life. I mean, some people think that God wants, wants life for humanity to be a dread. That God is, God is killing all of the joy and all of the fun of life. That that's what God is about. And that is contrary to everything that God stands for. That God wants us to enjoy life. But God points these two things out. And Jesus says it in another place. He says, you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to serve God, and he's very specific, he says, or you're going to serve money. Because Jesus realized back then how much of a hold money can have on every single one of us. And go back to what we started off, in, started off on in the beginning. Materialism, consumerism, egoism. Why? Because we love stuff so much, so we love Money even more because money buys the stuff. Money gets us the newer and the better. Money gets us the things that we don't really need, but we really want. Money gets, gets me the things that I, I, I want for my life. And Jesus would say, be careful. And Paul would echo those words and he'd say, be careful. Because you're going to put your trust in money. And we're going to look at this even next week. You're going to put your trust in money. And that money is just going to go right through your fingers because you're going to throw it everywhere, everywhere. And before you know it, maybe you had $50,000 in the bank account. Maybe you had $100,000. Maybe you had $500,000. Friends, you've seen this and you've, you've read about this. You've seen it in athletes over and over again. These guys that make millions of dollars, how in the world do they end up being bankrupt? Because money goes right through their fingertips because they just want, 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 want. And before we know it, we were on the plus side, and now we're thousands of dollars, 50000 100000 $500,000 in debt, all because our trust was in money. So Paul says, don't put your trust in money. Put your trust in God. Trust God that he's going to take care of your needs. Trust God that he's going to bless you. Trust God that he's going to take care of you. Trust God who richly, not who poorly. God doesn't say, well, here, I'll give you a little bit. No, he says, who richly, God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. I would say it this way, number seven, God is so charitable. He blesses you so life is not depressing because God wants you to enjoy life. He wants me to enjoy life. He doesn't want us going through life totally discouraged and, and getting to that place where we're depressed. And we know where depression le leads. We've seen it happen to family members. We've seen it happen to friends. We've read about it. We've seen it on the news. Depression just leads to death. People commit suicide because they're so depressed. That's not what God wants for you and for me. He doesn't want us to be discouraged. He doesn't want us to go around with an with a, with a Eeyore complex. He wants us to have hope. He wants us to know that he's not wanting for life to be depressing. And so he's going to be so charitable that he blesses our lives. If, again, we will live our lives according to his word, God says, I'm charitable. I'm going to bless you because I don't want life to be depressing. Notice. So let me, let me ask us this. Who does God care about? What is God focused on? And the overwhelming answer is you, is me. He is so concerned and he is so focused. He is so in love with humanity. And friends, what if we were the same way? What if this Christmas, this Christmas season, this holiday season, what if, what if just business in general, what if it wasn't about me? What if it was about you? What if it was about others? 
every day. Because God gives, friends, and he gives richly. And with all that said, we've got a lot to be thankful for. And this is just seven things. Because I didn't even talk about how much God gives us his peace, his comfort, his strength, his healing, his restoration, his deliverance. We didn't even touch on any of that. We could spend days, we could spend years looking through the word of God, seeing all the things that God's given. We have so much to, to be thankful for. In fact, Paul said it this way. He writes in Romans 7, 24 and 25, he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. My life is so miserable, Paul says. Life in and of itself is miserable, Paul says. And then he goes on, he says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? This life that is so miserable. Thank God. Thank God, Paul says, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul says, I thank God because I needed somebody to get rid of, rid of this miserable life. Life, honestly, friends, life would be so miserable if God took his hands off of this earth, if God removed himself, if God removed his grace and his mercy, see, people that don't even believe in God, people that don't even want anything to do with God, they experience, whether they realize it or not, they experience a level of God's mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness, his love. But if God removed that, friends, discouragement, depression, and death would be rampant. We think that it is a big deal right now in our society. It would be so much of a big deal, a bigger deal in our society if God removed himself and said, you know what? Maybe he'd use these words to hell with them. If God did, we have no idea how worse our society would be, how worse we would be. And Paul realized this. He said, life is so miserable without God. So Paul says, I'm going to thank God. I thank God for all that he's given. I thank God for Jesus Christ, who is the answer. I thank God for Jesus Christ. So the question, friends, what if? Let's start there. Before we even get to us giving... What if all I wanted was more of God? Because to take on more of God is not, just to, is not just to watch God give to us. Yes, God's going to give just as we've looked at these seven things. But God is also going to change your heart and he's going to change my heart. And we're going to become more like him. We're going to become givers like him.